Merci. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Uh, dear um, colleagues from European Consulates, uh, dear Emma, uh, Executive Director of the Alliance Française de Pasadena, dear President and members of the Board of the Alliance Française, dear speakers, uh, dear guests, um, c'est un grand plaisir uh, pour moi de participer aujourd'hui avec vous en personne et uh, à l'écran, avec uh, nos auditeurs à l'écran, à ce Café des sciences uh, qui est consacré à l'exploration de Jupiter et à la collaboration entre eux les États-Unis et l'Europe. It is an absolute pleasure to participate in this Café des Sciences with you in person at the Alliance Française of Pasadena and with you who are following the event remotely from uh, the United States, from France, from the Netherlands and other regions of the world. Today's edition of the um, Café des Sciences um, gives the floor to um, French scientists who participate in European or American programs aiming to unravel the secrets of Jupiter's ice moons. Um, this conference is part of a series of events with a strong European dimension organized by the French consulate in Los Angeles as France holds the presidency of the Council of the European Union during the first half of this year, 2022. And I'd like to warmly thank my colleagues from the other European consulates to be with us today in person and, and online. Your presence, all of you, uh, shows your interest in this event, uh, during which scientific discoveries, research and insights are going to be presented and discussed with um, experts. We are fortunate to have such talented speakers today as Dr. Julie Castillo, Elodie Lesage and Mathieu Choukroun, uh, from the Jet Propulsion uh, Laboratory, and Dr. Olivier Vitas from the European Space Agency, who is with us online. I'd like to thank you all, uh, the four of you, um, to, for sharing your research with us, with us today. Today's Café des Sciences is exciting in many, many ways. And first, because we will learn about a distant region of our galaxy, thanks to the JUICE mission and the Europa Clipper mission which will leave for the Jupiter system in 2023 and 2024. And also because the exploration of Jupiter's icy moons and the search for water oceans that is thought to be essential for life raise the questions of environment, water and habitability that are also paramount, as you all know here on our planet Earth. Today's Café des Sciences will also show us how essential collaborations between France, Europe, and the United States are to answer ambition, ambitious scientific questions. And as such, it resonates with the priorities of the French presidency. Oh, everybody good? Yeah, everybody good. Hear us? There we go. Okay, all right. Um, so before giving the floor to our uh, four wonderful speakers and, and thus embarking on this trip to Jupiter, I would like to encourage you um, to follow the, um, the, the Consulate General of France in Los Angeles on our different uh, social networks. Uh, to stay informed of the other Café des Sciences that uh, we will organize in the next uh, months. Uh, thanks to our science and technology uh, team, uh, represented today by Karine Bellarbi and Clara de Voissou. Thank you very much for organizing this uh, today. I would also like to thank the Alliance Française of Pasadena, uh, its president, board members, and executive director, Emma Franks, for hosting this event. Merci beaucoup de votre, de votre accueil. Uh, Aujourd'hui. Um, I wish you all an amazing Café des Sciences. I hope you will follow more Café des Sciences with us uh, and enjoy the, uh, the conference today. Merci beaucoup. Merci à tous. Uh, thank you, Julie Dilbertos. Uh, let me now introduce our speakers. 
So um, I will start with the ladies and please note that our panel perfectly respects parity and believe me, it was not intended to, but it actually gives a thoughtful hope for the future and for women in STEM. So, which is actually pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so let me begin with you, Dr. Julie Castillo. You are a senior research scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology. You received your PhD in planetary geophysics from the University of Rennes in France in 2001. And you have been involved in seven space missions in, value, in various roles. And you are also a co-investigator on the Europa Keeper mission on gravity radio science team. Um, so thank you for taking the time to introduce us to your, to your universe today. Um, Dr. Elodie Lesage, you are a postdoctoral researcher at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. You previously studied uh, physics and planetary sciences in France and obtained your PhD at the Paris-Saclay University in 2020. You are mostly interested in the ocean worlds of our solar system and beyond, and the eruption of icy volcanoes uh, at their surfaces. Elodie, you are an affiliate in the Europa Clipper project uh, science team. So thank you for being with us and for having helped me as you did on the organization management of this Café des Sciences. Um, to finish with the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, let me introduce Dr. Mathieu Choukroun. Uh, Mathieu, you are a planetary scientist whose uh, primary research focuses on exchange processes that take place between the interior and the surface of icy worlds and comets. Uh, this research involves experimental investigation of the properties of icy materials, modeling uh, of icy worlds and cometary environments, and participation in space missions such as uh, Rosetta or Europa Clipper. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing your advanced experience, expertise with us today. And last but not least, the project scientist of the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer mission and head of uh, the solar system section in the science directorate of the uh, European Space Agency, ESA, who is uh, Dr. Olivier with us, with us online today. You have uh, completed your PhD in 2000 um, at the University of Grenoble in France, and uh, on, on sorry, the Earth and the Mars upper, upper atmospheres, and then joined the ESA in 2003. And before working on JUICE, you were a project scientist of the Mars Express and ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter missions. So thank you for being with us in line uh, from the Netherlands to give us insights of the European role played uh, in this collaboration. So, well, as you can tell, uh, four very talented scientists, uh, French very talented scientists, at the, end of, at the head of NASA's and HISA's uh, space missions to Jupiter. So, not to mention the excellence of uh, French science and involvement in uh, worldwide cutting edge collaborations. So I won't be longer. I hope your seatbelts are fastened and your seats and table trays are up <laughs> position for takeout. Enjoy your journey to Jupiter's mood and Elodie, this is your time to shine. Perfect. Um, so thank you very much, Clara, for the introduction. Thank you everyone for attending um, online or in person. So uh, good morning or good evening, depending on which side of the ocean you are. Okay, so today I am going to talk about the icy moons of Jupiter, which are the coolest place in the solar system, and I hope you will be convinced in the end of the uh, presentation. So here to begin, you can see a family portrait of the uh, Galilean moons. So uh, these are the four largest moons of Jupiter. So by distance to Jupiter, there is first Io, then Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, uh, which we can see the name here. And so you can see here the great variety of surfaces of these moons. So Io is very hot, it's very volcanic. There are volcanoes everywhere on Io. And then we have Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, which are uh, covered with ice. <laughs> so uh, here you can see a close-up of the surfaces of Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. So you remember that everything you see here is ice. And so we can see uh, there are plenty of very interesting things going on on their surfaces. We can see uh, cracks, mountains, ridges, uh, domes, chaos, 
plenty of different things. And so uh, this makes the scientists uh, think that these bodies are very active geologically. So for a planetary body to maintain a geological activity, it needs a uh, energy source. So a heat source from its interior. So you can think of Earth. Um, on Earth, we have a lot of uh, geological activity. We have the plate tectonics, we have volcanoes, etc. And all that is possible because we have a lot of radioactivity in the Earth mantle that heats the uh, interior of Earth. Um, on the icy moon, there are no radioactive isotopes anymore. And so the heat comes from another source. And this heat source is what we call the tidal heating. So because of the proximity of Jupiter and the motion of the uh, icy moons around Jupiter, their interior is periodically deformed. And so this generates a friction that creates heat in their uh, rocky mantle and ice crust. So for example, on Europa, um, we believe that this heat is uh, high enough to maintain a liquid ocean below the ice crust, as you can see here. So on Europa, we believe the ice crust is approximately 30 kilometers thick and the ocean is somewhere around 100 uh, kilometers deep. So it's a lot of water. On Ganymede, there is even more uh, water uh, than on Europa. Um, there are two ice shells and an ocean in between these ice shells. And we believe the, the, the thickness of this ice and water layer is somewhere around 250 kilometers. Mm -hmm. And finally, on Callisto, uh, so Callisto is further from Jupiter, so it's less heated than Europa and Ganymede. So we're not sure if there's a liquid uh, ocean, but there is also a very important uh, ice crust. So here you can see a very cool uh, video from ESA of the interior of the uh, Galilean moons. So first, Ayo which is very cool too. I'm sorry, we're not talking about Io today, but so it's very hot because it's close to Jupiter. And then we have Europa that's covered in um, ice and water because it's a bit further from Jupiter. So you can see here the um, ice and water layer and then the uh, rocky interior. And then we have Ganymede. So in Ganymede, as I said, there are two layers um, of ice and an ocean in between, and then also a rocky interior and iron uh, core, just like on Europa. And then Callisto is a bit colder, so we, we're not sure if there is an ocean. And the, um, the interior of Callisto is a mix of iron and uh, rocks. So uh, two missions are going to launch soon to uh, explore these very interesting moons. There is a JUICE from the European Space Agency and Europa Clipper from NASA. So Olivier is going to talk more about JUICE uh, later. Um, so JUICE will launch in April 2023 and arrive in orbit around Jupiter in uh, July 2031. Uh, and Europa Clipper will launch in October 2024 and arrive uh, around Jupiter in April 2030. So I am going to talk about Europa Clipper because it is the mission I work on. So Europa Clipper uh, will uh, focus 100% on Europa and search for the ingredients for life on Europa. Uh, because we believe uh, it's necessary to have water, um, chemistry, energy, et cetera, to, uh, for life to develop on um, uh, planetary bodies. So Europa Clipper will search for these uh, conditions on Europa. So uh, because of the heat generated in the interior of Europa, we believe it's possible that its uh, ocean floor could look like the ocean floors on Earth. So what you see on this video is not Europa, it's uh, the Earth oceans. Yeah, unfortunately it's not Europa. Um, so you can see there is a lot of hydrothermal activity on Earth, thanks to the uh, interior heating. And this uh, hydrothermal activity uh, feeds a lot of life forms. So these animals don't have any light from the sun, so they survive only on the uh, hydrothermal vents. And so we wonder if it's possible that we uh, find something similar on Europa. There's supposed to be something on this slide. Oh, great. OK, so uh, Europa Clipper will uh, explore and investigate the habitability of Europa. So what we call habitability are the uh, conditions for the development of life. So uh, Europa Clipper is a huge mission. It will uh, um, allow the study of a very large panel of things. So first, first, it is going to uh, measure uh, more precisely the thickness of the ice shell and the ocean on Europa. 
We also are going to study the composition of Europa's surface, atmosphere, and oceans. Um, we will also be able to um, make geological studies on Europa thanks to the uh, wonderful images we're going to have thanks to Europa Clipper. Uh, Europa Clipper is also going to study the uh, water activity on Europa because some data suggests that it's possible we have some uh, eruptions of water around Europa, so geysers or ice volcanoes. So this is something uh, Europa Clipper will answer to. And finally, it will perform a uh, reconnaissance because in the future, if we want to land on Europa's surface to um, sample it and search for life forms, we have to know where to land. So this is also something uh, Europa Clipper will do. So this is what the Europa Clipper uh, spacecraft will look like once it will be completely assembled. So the two huge wings are the solar arrays that will provide the energy uh, for the instruments. There will be a total of nine instruments on the, uh, the, the core of the spacecraft. So Mathieu will describe the instruments later, I think. Um, and yeah, so what you can see here are the uh, radar antennas that will uh, look through the ISL of Europa, which is super cool. And so finally, when Europa will ar arrive at Jupiter, it will uh, make flybys of Europa. So it will orbit Jupiter and not directly Europa. So it will be in orbit around Jupiter and sometimes fly by Europa to make measurements. So why that? It is because the environment around the icy moons is very harmful for the spacecraft because there are plenty of charged uh, particles around the icy moons. And so uh, every time the spacecraft will make a flyby of Europa, it will be damaged. And so we want to minimize the radiation um, that, will be, uh, that the spacecraft will be exposed to. So this is why we are going to orbit Jupiter, as you can see here. Um, so normally we should be able to uh, perform approximately 50, at least 50 flybys of Europa, which will enable plenty of um, measurements and extraordinary science for many, many years. Uh, so if you want to get involved in Europa Clipper and receive the latest news, I invite you to join us on the social networks. And also, I really, really encourage you to go uh, look at the uh, europa.nasa.gov website because it is absolutely amazing. <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much. And Olivier, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Olivier. Do you, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. So very good. So the, uh, good morning, good afternoon to uh, to everybody. Thanks for the for the invitation. Always happy to share the uh, our beautiful mission, which is called JUICE, the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer mission. So this slide uh, shows the the poster that we have made to uh, to illustrate the mission. So you see already from from this poster what we are going to do during this uh, this mission. So you see already the spacecraft, how the it looks like. You see Jupiter in the background, so we'll be orbiting Jupiter uh, for a few years. We'll be observing Jupiter in detail, including the array that you see on this image. And we are uh, mostly interested by the icy moon. So you see uh, the three icy moons here in the foreground, you have Ganymede, and then uh, in smaller, you see Europa and Callisto on the right. Io is on the left, we are less interested in Io. And we are mainly interested in Ganymede. Uh, that will be our main target. I will be talking about that. And we would like to, to understand, uh, in short, is there any habitable place around Jupiter? So is there places where life could have started in the past or could start in the future? And as Elodie mentioned, it's really linked to the subsurface liquid water, which uh, is underneath the, the icy crust of the three icy moons. So next slide. Here, a little bit more complicated, but just to give you more information on the science of, of, uh, of the mission. So this, um, this image illustrates the complexity of the system. We go around Jupiter, we have the giant planet. Uh, we have a very intense uh, magnetic field, a large magnetosphere. And this is illustrated by the, by the red part, uh, illustrating the fact that there is an active magnetosphere with a lot of charged particles, which are interesting to study and are very difficult when you uh, when you design a spacecraft because of the of the radiation we have all the moons around so around 70 moons including the four galilean moons there is a lot of uh, coupling between all these elements uh, via the gravitational law and also via the electromagnetic law so the via the magnetic field line so when you want to study uh, one element like the moon, you need also to understand the other one and JUICE will make a uh, will have a detailed picture of all the system. 
So we are mainly interested in the three IC moons, so Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto, because of the liquid subsurface ocean and the question of habitability. The main target is Ganymede. At the end of the mission, we'll even orbit Ganymede for a few months. We are interested in, in Europa because it's a very in, uh, interesting target for astrobiology. We'll make two flybys of Europa and Callisto to complete the picture because Callisto is really different from, from the other moon. And Jupiter, we will study that in detail to understand why around a, a, a giant planet like Jupiter, there could be places uh, that could uh, host uh, life. So we'll study the Jupiter atmosphere, the Aurora, the magnetosphere, and all the other satellites, and also the ring system. So it's really a broad and interdisciplinary science. When we dream about planetary mission, in fact, we just we are we have everything because we study um, the interior of, of moons, the surface, the little atmosphere, the interaction between the, the moon environment and Jupiter, Jupiter, all the all the moons, the magnetosphere, and so on. So it's a very rich uh, science. So next slide. And that's how the spacecraft uh, will look like. So it's a kind of standard spacecraft, but the shape is quite interesting with this uh, uh, special shape for the for our sun, for solar panel. We have a, a large solar panel because we are far from the sun, so 80, 85 square meters. Uh, you can find on the on our website all information about the, the instrument. I will not get into all the details, but just to mention that we have 10 instruments on board. Uh, very complex state of the art instrument. We, we don't go to Jupiter every time. So when we put a spacecraft with instrument, we try to, to include the best. So we have uh, four remote sensing instruments, so camera and all kinds of spectrometers to observe Jupiter and the surface of the moons. Uh, the long boom that you see uh, in the spacecraft is a, is, a, is a 16 meter radar antenna to, to penetrate the, the ice and to understand the first kilometers of ice on the icy moons. On the bottom, yeah, there is another boom, which is 10 meter long, where we'll put all the uh, sensitive magnetic uh, field uh, sensors, because we would like to measure the magnetic field in the Jupiter system. This is very important. We could, uh, we could discuss that later. Uh, we have some particle uh, instrument to, uh, to measure the, the radiation environment. Uh, we have a radio science experiment to, to understand the gravity of this, uh, of this body. And the, the telecommunication signal of JUICE will be uh, recorded with an array of, so of uh, uh, radio observatories on Earth to, uh, to pinpoint really precisely the position of JUICE and to get more information on the ephemerides of the moon and on the gravity field of, of the moons. So next slide. So that was an illustration, but I, I thought it would be good to show you also a real picture. So that's um, uh, pictures that were, that were taken last year. So you see the, the, the spacecraft uh, in the clean room that was in, in, uh, in Germany, in one of our industrial centers. So you can see, uh, you can um, have an idea about the shape or the size of the spacecraft with respect to the, to the people around. And these particular pictures illustrate when we were mounting on the spacecraft, the, the big antenna, uh, and uh, the antenna, obviously, it's very important component to be able to communicate with the, with the spacecraft and to download all the precious uh, data. So next slide. Another image of the, of the spacecraft still in Germany. Uh, and here uh, we were mounting the, the big boom that you see on the, on the foreground, so the bl black boom. Uh, it's uh, what we call the magnetometer boom. So it's a 10 meter boom when it will be deployed, but when it's attached to the spacecraft, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's in three parts. And you see how on, the, on the right how the, 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 the boom was mounted on the spacecraft. And that's a very important element because we want to measure very tiny magnetic field uh, in the space environment of Jupiter. And we don't want to measure the magnetic field generated by the spacecraft, uh, the electronics, and so on. We are not very interested by that. So we try to put these sensors as far as possible from the spacecraft. And that's why we have a 10 meter uh, boom for, for that. So next slide. Here, that's a, an image of a test uh, that we have been doing with a, with a spacecraft uh, where I work at uh, the European Space Agency in the, in the Netherlands. So we put the spacecraft into a chamber to, to test the, the thermal environment and to see if uh, the, the, the spacecraft design is okay and the instrument as well, if they survive the uh, cold temperatures, warm temperatures, illumination uh, in the space environment. So we put the spacecraft into this big chamber for one month 
and we test whether the spacecraft behave and we are quite uh, happy with, uh, with, with the result. And you see here the, the high gain antenna, which is a very, very special uh, white uh, painting. So the next slide. After this test, we uh, so you, you have seen already that the spacecraft moved from Germany to the Netherlands. And after that, we moved it to France. So you see uh, how complex is it also from the industrial uh, point of view in Europe. We have different sites with different responsibility for the assembly testing of the spacecraft. And here we, uh, we ship the spacecraft to, to France in Toulouse. And for that, we use a, a big plane uh, that was here on the airport of, uh, of Cologne. And for the for the story, you, this uh, this plane are the um, big antenna that uh, were used to uh, to ship uh, the the spacecraft like juice, very useful because you can put everything into this uh, this plane. And unfortunately, due to the current uh, ge geopolitical situation, we, we will not be able to use those planes anymore. So we have to find another uh, way to ship the spacecraft from Europe to uh, to the spaceport uh, early next year. So next slide. So here, that's uh, something about the crew. So we, we plan to, to launch the spacecraft in April next year. And you see here an animation, what will happen in 2031 before we, uh, we enter into orbit around Jupiter. There will be a first Ganymede flyby. We have done recently a, a, a release of many animations. So you can find on the, on the ESA website uh, some, I think, some nice animation to see what the spacecraft will be doing. So here it's a 400 kilometer Ganymede flyby to help for the orbit insertion uh, around Jupiter. So it's a kind of kind of a risky uh, maneuver, uh, but that's uh, what we what in, in the planning. So during the cruise phase, the eight year cruise phase, there will be uh, four uh, flybys to, uh, to help just to reach Jupiter. We cannot go directly to Jupiter. There will be an Earth moon flyby. So you see the trajectory on the right. So uh, one Earth moon flyby, then a Venus flyby and two Earth flyby, and then finally, we can reach Jupiter in something like eight, uh, eight years in 2031. So we have to be very patient when we work for, uh, for the planetary mission. Next slide. Here, that's an example of one Europa flyby. There will be something like 30 flybys in total of uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto during the mission. And here, we, we illustrate a 400 kilometer flyby. Uh, one of our two Europa flybys, we don't want to do more because of the radiation environment. And we will we'll collect uh, very useful information on, on Europa. Next, next slide. And uh, here we last year we did a, a drawing competition um, uh, to, uh, to decorate the, the, the top of the launcher. Uh, next year there will be a big sticker and we wanted to, uh, uh, to put a drawing of, of a kid. So we launched a competition for the five to 12 years old kids uh, all around the world. And we have selected uh, last year this, uh, this beautiful uh, image. And for the, for the nice story, uh, the winner is an Ukrainian a young, young girl. But, so that's part of the, of the story of Juice, I think. Next uh, slide. And just to, to summarize the challenges, we can come back to that if you have any questions. But there, of course, for this kind of mission, there are a lot of challenges, technical, and in particular, the radiation environment, quite difficult for the spacecraft design. Thermal, there will be a hot and, and, and cold environment. So cold around Jupiter and hot during the cruise phase when we fly by Venus. And the power is a problem because you are far from the sun. So we need to have huge solar arrays to, uh, to power the spacecraft. In terms of operation, it's also quite complex. In terms of navigation, there will be many flybys, two orbit insertion, one around Jupiter, one around Ganymede. We have to deal with planetary protection. So we have to show that we will not impact uh, Europa, for example. And on the operational uh, challenge, there is also the power and data volume, which is limited. And all the instruments, they would like to use as much power as possible and, and download as much data volume as possible, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not possible. Um, so uh, we, we need to deal with that. It's also a challenge. And programmatics, uh, in the last few years, we were wondering whether we'll use ASEAN 5 or 6. But I, I think now it's settled, so we'll use uh, one of the fine, uh, final, if not the last, uh, Ariane 5 in next year. And human point of view, always challenging because such a project last uh, more than 30 years. So we need to be patient and we need to make sure that the information is given uh, at the right time at the right person from the beginning to the end. So it's not the least uh, challenge of our project. 
Next slide. And here, I'll, uh, I guess you will get the slides, or otherwise you can find the information on our website, but uh, there is a lot of uh, information and you can follow us also on Twitter. We, we release uh, images regularly and we are making a, a movie to explain the making of juice behind the scene. And you can find uh, seven episodes on uh, YouTube and I think they are quite nice to, uh, to understand what is going on uh, behind, uh, behind the scenes. So stay tuned, and uh, we, uh, for the next slide, I will I will change slightly the, the topic uh, because we wanted to discuss this uh, Europa Clipper and Juice collaboration, which I think it's uh, it's very nice. We will be very lucky to have two spacecraft uh, at the same time around Jupiter, and I think it's uh, just uh, great. So we are we are very excited by that, and I will illustrate what we can do with the the two spacecraft together. So next uh, slide. So here, the, uh, a quick illustration to, to show the two orbits of the two spacecraft. So Juice is in uh, uh, light blue, uh, while a, a Clipper is in dark blue, and Jupiter is in the middle. So you see that we'll, both, both spacecraft will orbit uh, Jupiter. Uh, even if at the end we orbit Ganymede, we'll still orbit, be orbit uh, Jupiter. And just to show that, uh, yeah, they will be quite interesting in terms of, uh, of orbits. There will be always some uh, interesting conditions. So the craft close to each other or far from each other, we could do joint observations. So uh, I think that will be very, very interesting. Next slide. Uh, here, another view of the of the two, uh, the two orbits. So you see Jupiter in the middle, Juice is in pink and the Clipper is in uh, uh, green or blue. You see that both spacecraft will never be very close to Jupiter. Uh, we are very careful about that because of the radiation environment. Of course, Clipper will be uh, 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 flyby doing the flyby of Europa many times, 50 times or so, but most of the time it will go far from Jupiter and Europa. And the same for Juice, there will be 30 flybys uh, during the, the mission, and at the end we will be orbiting Ganymede. So again, plenty of opportunity uh, to study Europa, Callisto, Ganymede, and Jupiter. So next, next slide. And here that shows uh, uh, for what concerned the, the flyby of the icy moon. So on the top, as a function of time, so from uh, beginning of 2031 until the end of 2034, so we cover three years here. And on the top, we have Callisto, and the juice flybys are in red, and the, the clipper flyby in blue. So you see that there will be more flyby of Callisto by Juice, but in the middle, there will be a kind of overlap between the, the two missions, including some flybys very close to each other. And if possible, that will really enhance the science that we will do at Callisto. So do complementary measurement, calibration, uh, compare the data. That's always very useful. For Europa, that's the second line. There will be, of course, many uh, flybys by, uh, by uh, a Clipper, so 50 or so, and two flybys of uh, of uh, juice uh, of Europa by juice by Europa. The interesting aspect, you are very lucky because one of the flyby will be uh, just separated by four hours between the two spacecraft. So again, to to measure the space environment or to compare the data, that will be quite spectacular to have two uh, spacecraft with a great instrumentation doing measurement at the same time. And for Ganymede, here the situation is a little bit different. There will be no overlap in terms of uh, flybys between the two missions but we can still uh, do a useful uh, collaboration uh, here. Next slide. Maybe in the rest of, in the rest of time, I will, I will skip this one. So next, next one. Uh, I think I mentioned that uh, that's the, a very special flyby of, of Europa with the two spacecraft, uh, more or less following each other for a few days or a few hours and then doing the, the flyby at, four, at uh, with a separation of time at four hours. I think that this one will be quite spectacular. So next, next slide. And here that shows the, the magnetosphere of Jupiter. And on the left, you see the two spacecraft traveling together, so the, the two dot. Uh, and we illustrate the fact that they will be traveling along uh, more or less the same magnetic field line. So we can really understand here better the the plasma environment of Jupiter, which is quite variable in, in time and space. And for that, it's always much better to have two spacecraft, uh, like we have many uh, missions on that around the Earth to understand the Earth's environment. So we can do similar uh, 
uh, studies at Jupiter. And it's very interesting because Jupiter is the most intense uh, space environment in the, in the solar system. Uh, next slide. I think that's, I will, I will give the floor to, uh, to Mathieu, I think. <laughs> so thank you. Hi, uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone in the room and online. Very happy to be here. So uh, what I wanted to talk about uh, after this very nice introduction of both Europa Kleber, thank you, Elodie, and the Juice, thank you, Olivier. I wanted to emphasize one thing that's really critical to space missions is the multidisciplinarity aspects of those missions. It manifests itself in everything that we do. Uh, first of all, for the questions that we're trying to answer, because those are very fundamental questions. Is Europa habitable? That's not a simple question. And although you might want to think, okay, there is a yes or a no answer to it, but really it gets much more complicated than that. And so that's, that's the kind of things that we have to address via multiple science approaches. And in order to do this, then we have to use different types of data sets so that we can answer the, make the, the measurements that will help us address those questions. And last but not least, in order to do this, it's, there's a box that's missing right here, uh, apparently, but um, oh, let's see if it shows up, no. But if it goes back, nope, never mind. Well, so it's okay, I'll keep that for later, it will be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and so, it, for instance, understanding habitability, as I mentioned, is not a yes or no question, it's, it's very complicated. Um, Elodie alluded to that in the case of uh, Europa, but that's also true for Ganymede, it's also true for any other world that we want to understand it. As far as we know it, life needs three concrete things in the right proportions in order to develop and sustain itself. It needs liquid water. So in the case of Europa, uh, we, have the, we have an internal uh, liquid water ocean that's present beneath the ice shell. I think there is very strong evidence from uh, the Galileo mission that this ocean is there, we, we, we expect that to be there. So that's one box that's checked. But you also need the right elements, the, the right organic elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur in order to um, make the molecules that will then allow for life to develop. And then you also need to have a source of energy so that life can sustain itself in nutrients so that the, the potential life forms that could develop then can survive in that environment. So all of this touches upon many, many different branches of science. And at the highest level already, you can see that you need physics in a broad scale to understand the energy. Uh, we talked about radioactive elements, uh, tidal forcing by Jupiter. Chemistry, obviously, for the chemical makeup of the ocean and the organic molecules that, that, may, be, um, that may promote the development of life and then biology as to how potential life forms would use that. But in addition to those uh, science questions, how can we really measure all this? Because unfortunately, Europa Clipper is not gonna dive through the ice shell of Europa and into the ocean and find the hydrothermal vent, uh, probably hundreds of hundred kilometers down the road. So we have to make measurements with the, within the environment that Europa Clipper is going to be in. It's the same for JUICE. Those are space missions that will be flying around Jupiter and make measurements from a distance, remote sensing measurements, as well as some in-situ measurements to characterize their environment. So in the case of Europa Clipper, there is uh, nine instruments shown here, and it's in fact, it's missing, missing a tenth one that does not have an instrument on its own is the gravity. Um, so because that is done using the telecom system. But so, first of all, because a lot of the payload is via remote sensing, let's look at it via the, the, the electromagnetic spectrum, starting at the lowest wavelength in the UV. And so there's, here is the Euro, Europa UVS instrument. It's a UV spectrometer. And with that instrument, you will be able to measure the emission lines of specific atoms or molecules that are present in the atmosphere of Europa, such as oxygen, hydrogen, etc. Now, if you go 
into the visible, obviously that's where the camera is right here is going to be. And that's not a camera uh, with a high dynamic range and a smart camera that's gonna adjust to the lighting conditions so that you can get the prettiest picture you want to post on Instagram. No, that's a really scientific camera. That means that it's very well calibrated so that when they measure a certain number of photons at the detector, they know exactly how many photons actually came there. And that's what's necessary so that we can understand the reflexivity of the surface and that will help us understand uh, some of the, the, the compounds that may be there. Now, if you go further into the, the infrared, then there is the infrared spectrometer, MICE, which is also my pixel spectrometer. And then in the infrared, you have signature of compounds that are present on the surface that we'll be able to see. So in, in collaboration between ICE and MICE, we'll be able to get a picture of the composition of the surface. And if you go even further into the, the IR spectrum, then you go into the thermal infrared where uh, Ethemis is going to actually measure the surface temperature. And from that, we'll be able to see the hotspots that might indicate plumes, whether how the temperature varies as a function of day and night, which will inform the, the, the thermal property of the crust and so on. And then even further into the longer wavelength, then you have radar reason which is going to probe inside the ice shell to try and see whether there are potentially liquid pockets, whether we can sense all the way down to the ocean. If not, there are some cases where that may be possible. So that will help really better understand the ice shell as a whole. So with all of these remote sensing instruments, we'll get some sense of atmospheric composition and then surface and subsurface. There are also the in-situ instruments uh, mentioned here. So two mass spectrometer, one that will measure dust particles in the Europa environment, the other one will measure the gas particles. So that will help us measure, understand the atmosphere of Europa, which is extremely tenuous, and also whether there are potential plumes. If plumes come from the ocean, then we could have signatures of life of some of the organic compounds that we are after. So these instruments will help tackle uh, really more the composition questions. The magnetometer on Europa Clipper, just as the one on Jews, will help characterize the Jupiter environment as a whole. But in the case of Europa in particular, we will be able to make some inferences about the composition of the ocean from its electrical conductivity. And last but not least, the plasma environment is another important component that the PIMS instrument is going to measure. So as you can see, it's a whole bunch of different instruments that use very different physical principles in order to acquire very different data sets that allow us to try and understand the habitability of uh, Europa. And in order to do that, then that's, right now we have the instruments, but they need to get all the way to Europa and they cannot be sent in a vacuum. So first of all, you need a spacecraft. The spacecrafts are really big, they are very complicated. It takes tens, hundreds of people to make a spacecraft. It takes years to build it. It's a lot of mechanical structures, a huge amount of electrical connections in order to make that, in order to do, communicate or talk to the instrument and command the instruments. And then once you have the spacecraft, you need to send it. So then you need to, you need a big rocket to get there, but that's not the only thing the spacecraft has to be able to also adjust its trajectory. And so make sure that you can uh, take advantage of celestial mechanics and mission design to, pro to get the spacecraft to where we want. And once it's there, well, we have to make sure that we get, that we, we can stay in that environment and we can acquire the data that we want at the spots that we want. So that requires navigation and pointing. And obviously you also have to have a uh, large amount of power. You saw those gigantic solar arrays on Europa Clipper and, um, and Juice that are necessary so that we can have enough power, but you also need the battery system and then manage that power to keep the spacecraft alive and well and operate the instruments when needed. On top of that, space is extremely cold, so you have to have a very good understanding of the thermal environment that is going to be in or in throughout its it's uh, time to the mission, then you have to be able to store the data. It's one thing to have an instrument. If you don't get the data down, that doesn't help us. So we have whole aspects of avionics that, uh, that's 
are necessary in order to store the data on board and compress it, package it. Uh, Olivier mentioned the difficulties with the very low downlink capabilities that, that were, that were going to be affected with. So all of that is another area of engineering that is difficult. And then we have to send all of the data down. We have to have antennas on the ground that can receive all the data. And once we have the data on the ground, then it is to be distributed to the various science team around the world that analyze the data so that we can accomplish the science. And last but not least, the very important aspect of space missions is because it takes so long to get there and we have uh, th those data are so precious, it's really critical that they are saved very preciously and stored so that they can be used by future generations of scientists. So this is where the archiving duties come in and with NASA, for instance, and, uh, and uh, ESA as well have their own uh, very well-managed arch archiving system so that anyone in the world can go and get the data from there to convey their own studies. So as you can see, it really takes a, an, an entire, it takes villages in order to make those missions work. It's, it's very, very challenging. It's fascinating because we're trying to answer truly fundamental questions uh, that are important to mankind as a whole. As a whole these huge teams who are talking about hundreds of scientists, I didn't mention here, but also hundreds of engineers, and that's going to spend years and years of their life in order to develop the mission, wait until we get there, and then analyze the data. You know, that's, uh, it's, uh, it's tre tremendous endeavors. And it really uh, it, it, you, it makes, uh, takes advantage of the entire international science community, where sciences from Europe and the US on both Europa, Clipper, and Jews, which will help uh, those develop a strong collaboration. If we use have to use facilities all around the globe. I'm showing here one of the DSS stations that's actually in Australia. So it's managed by NASA, but it's in Australia, which is kind of fun. So uh, really things that go across the entire world. And on top of that, we will talk about the duration. I wanted to show these plots so, so that people can capture that, that a little bit. And so we've talked about the long cruise to get to Jupiter. It takes, it, it will take you, your clipper six years to get to Jupiter. Uh, Juice is gonna take eight years. And then there are a few years in orbit, but once it's one thing to get there, it, it, it takes many years to develop the spacecraft and instruments before that. And in order to have the missions approved and have the agencies uh, be willing to spend the large amounts of uh, dollars that these missions cost, then it takes many years often to actually develop the concepts and mature it, make sure that it's reasonable, that it's feasible, that we'll be able to achieve the scientific objectives that we want. So basically, I'm putting here the large space missions that have been done by um, NASA and ESA uh, since the since the seventies, and you can see there was Voyager. Voyager inspired Galileo and Cassini Huygens, which were uh, developed in the eighties. And Galileo arrived at Jupiter in the late nineties. Cassini Huygens was at Saturn from uh, two thousand four. That's when I started my PhD until twenty seventeen. And then Rosetta was inspired by the flyby of Comet Halley by Giotto in nineteen eighty six. So uh, there was a kid back then. That's when some of those people started to develop Rosetta. I was very lucky to have the opportunity to join the team right just before we got there and be involved in the current operations. But literally, I joined Rosetta here. Or there are some people that have been working on it for 30 years before that. So you know, it, it really takes many people, many people, many generations of scientists. Europa Clipper and Zeus both were inspired by Voyager and Galileo. So as you can see, you know, while looking at things that really spend multiple generations of scientists and engineers. So thank you very much. That's what I wanted to leave you with. Huge endeavors, lots of people, lots of people. And I think now I'll leave the floor to you. Hi everyone, I'm very pleased to be here and I want to thank everybody who was involved in the organization and especially uh, Clara for re reaching out to me early on 
that is very nice. And LOD for really organizing everything on the GPL side, which can be an adventure because there's some bureaucracy involved. <laughs> I'm not going to go into the details, but thank you, LOD. So as Matthew said, I mean, so a big scientist, a very major scientist said that the outer solar system missions are like cathed walls. It takes very long time for them to develop. And as Matthew demonstrated, you know, it can make take 60 years. And that's the case of the Voyager missions. Everything started with Voyager in terms of the exploration of the outer solar system. In 1965, uh, you know, emerging scientists, because there was no, not really a planetary uh, exploration program at the time, uh, some scientists uh, found out that th there was this opportunity to send a spacecraft or two spacecraft, Voyager 1 and 2, that they would be able to follow a trajectory that has you know, optimized, that doesn't require a lot of energy, that would allow them to visit the four giant planet system in the outer solar system. And so at the time, the NASA program was very reactive. There was way more money involved at the time, but also uh, you know, everybody was very excited. Today, we are a little bit afraid of risk because of the mission, I mean, as Olivier showed, these missions they are very challenging. And so it takes time to make sure they are going to work out. But at the time, these pioneers were like, wow, let's do this, you know, let's send this spacecraft. And it took, you know, it took care to, to send them, but they were very, very swift in making that happen. And so they sent the Voyager spacecraft. It was a big adventure. They were very successful. And they really paved the way for our generation. Because, uh, for example, I, I was just about to get into a university when a Voyager 2 crossed uh, the Neptune system. And that was very inspiring for an entire generation. Um, something else that was very inspiring, and I'm sorry I'm not showing that here, is the Gioto uh, flyby of Comet Halley. That was spectacular in Europe. That was such a big deal for ISA because ISA led uh, a fleet of, I think, six spacecraft, uh, JAXA, that was a creation of the Japanese space agency, for example. And as I was involved, and Roscosmos, the uh, USSR space agency, was also involved. It was a big, big deal. And so that was inspiring for us. I just want to show the pioneers. So here are some pioneers on the US side. And here are a few pioneers also on the European side who participated in that mission. And that is thanks to these people that, oh, I'm sorry, my animation is messed up. <laughs> thanks to these people that, you know, we've had succession of missions since. So in 1979, Voyager 1 and 2 arrived in the Jupiter system and that really led to full on missions, Galileo, Jude, Juno, and Anio Batiba as we heard. Um, something that I want to point out that's funny is that when Galileo finished uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, the planetary science uh, lab in Nantes, where I come from, where Mathieu uh, comes from as well, not Elodie, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they wanted to propose a full on mission, and we proposed in 1998, and that mission that proposal was declined and then we proposed again and that proposal was declined and again and again i think there were like five instances of follow-on missions to galileo to the german system and finally europa clipper that started in the mid-2010s and finally i was able to get on another i mean on, on a jupiter mission in uh, like just two years ago so it's been exciting so um then there was in the 19, sorry, I'm not sure, 1996, uh, so there was uh, Voyager 1 and then the following year, there was Voyager 2 crossing the Saturnian system. And it was really, really spectacular. And this led to the Cassini Huygens mission. And as Matthew noted, uh, people started brainstorming about uh, the Cassini mission at the beginning of the 1980s. And uh, the people behind that mission, uh, these two people, they played an enormous role in making that happen. So that's because of Voyager that we could get Cassini, basically. And uh, very soon, like in a few years, there is going to be another mission uh, to the Saturnian system, which is called Dragonfly, it's going to focus on um, Titan, uh, the Titan, the yellow <laughs> boy here. Um, and I'd really focus on exploring the surface of that Titan, which is we believe it's covered by uh, lakes of hydrocarbons. 
and it's going to be very exciting mission. There is a rotor path actually. There are four rotor paths. It's going to be very exciting. And something that's going to be very exciting for us at JPL and Olivier and his colleagues at Pizar is that we are just about to uncover a new plant of exploration for the next decade. It's what we call the decadal survey. Uh, basically, it's a big survey of what we learn and what we should learn in the following decades. And it's led by scientists, uh, not by NASA. It's really scientists telling NASA what should be done. And it will be released in two weeks, April 19. And some things that we are anticipating, uh, and we've been anticipating for the, you know, since uh, the Voyager 2 went to the Uranus system and the Neptune system, is the follow-on mission that will be dedicated to the exploration of this system. And I know that uh, ISA has its own decadal survey. Oh, it's been more several decades. It's called Voyage 2050. It was released last year. What really, really hopes that we could have a collaboration between the two that we keep working together uh, and explore uh, these fabulous worlds. So just a word on Cassini Hogan's, just to give you an idea of the extent of the collaboration. There were 70 countries involved. I'm just and there were many uh, states involved in the United States. Uh, there were up, up to 1,000 people at, uh, the, in the peak of the mission. Mm -hmm. And I think there were about 300 scientists. It was enormous. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it was such a fascinating mission. Many, many uh, early career scientists really started uh, with Cassini. And when we don't have uh, ongoing missions, you know, we might have gaps. Then there is something else going on that is also very important in terms of international collaboration and space telescopes. Again, these are very huge endeavors, and sometimes they are cathedral too, and that's definitely the case for Hubble. Mm -hmm. Hubble has been I'm still working. Hubble is extraordinary, and the James Webb Space Telescope, mm -hmm. which you know was very successful. Mm -hmm. I must tell you, I was proud mm -hmm. <laughs> when the news reported that Ariane had overachieved in their deployment of GWST because you know that was great. We've been waiting for this mission for a while now. And you know it's working perfectly, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. And then in between we, we also had uh, Herschel is not working anymore, but, but it's also been uh, a very, very interesting mission in terms of uh, for example observing the um, gas uh, properties of uh, ice things uh, over objects. So planetary exploration is a universal and they will. And this map, which is on the public website, it shows the origin of all the people who were involved in the Cassini mission. And so, you know, maybe we were born in Africa and then went to work at JPL, or were born in Asia and went to work with ISA. And so you can see, I mean, all the, the continents are represented. And then many, many countries are represented. But something we've noted on this mission is that there is some bias. You know, it's, we've not reached a point where necessarily um, investment in science and science research necessarily represents the diversity of the participants in the mission. And here, just to illustrate the gap uh, between uh, the involvement of women and men on science teams. <laughs> for various missions and especially the, the, the ones that we've been discussing. So you see when <laughs> Voyager started, sorry I forgot to mention, the, when Voyager started, it, it just one so it's different Voyager, mm -hmm. uh, there were almost no women on the science team. Mm -hmm. And uh, but okay, and there were a few, you know, about eight percent on Cassini, uh, Europa Clipper is much better, we have 20 percent women involvement. I was you know, privileged to be on the Dawn mission where uh, before Dragonfly got selected, we really made an effort to involve uh, a more diverse uh, uh, participant, more diverse mm -hmm. participants, uh, but women, uh, various aspects of diversity, actually. And, and it's been kind of pioneering. Basically, this inspired Dragonfly mission to do the same. And so we hope that future missions are going to be even more diverse and more representative of the current uh, population. And so at JPL, and I know the same is going on on the ESA side, 
if we have programs that help promote the diversity, so that's just an example of a you know, picture of an event we organized uh, for visiting the laborat uh, laboratory at Caltech, laboratory of robotics, and we really try to uh, have diverse participation, and because that is, you know, by doing so, we ensure that we have a more diverse workforce, which is necessarily more creative and is going to tackle uh, the challenges that the mission uh, face. So just to give you another example, right now we have uh, opportunities open for uh, planetary science summer schools at JPL. We have two of them. People on the line are interested. I think the deadline is in two weeks. So you can just you know, Google uh, JPL summer school and this will show us. And I, I want to show my colleague, uh, Serena Vinega, because that's the picture from 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And she started in of the school, and now she's one of the leaders on the mice instruments that, um, that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and maybe, maybe, maybe about 30% of uh, scientists who went uh, through the summer school that you began have ended up on missions. Mm -hmm. So you're welcome to you know, turn around than your colleagues to uh, apply and uh, it's a fantastic experience and I think I found that. <laughs> so thank you very much for this uh, clear and uh, breathtaking presentation. Uh, just before ending the Q&A session, I would also like to invite you to have a look at the interview uh, Dr. Caitlin Harens, who is a postdoctoral of NASA program fellow. Uh, gave me on Jupiter in uh, Native American culture and how um, and on how indigenous uh, astro knowledge has enriched uh, today's space sciences. Mm. So she accepted to give this uh, interview uh, to promote this event, and you will find the video on uh, our social media. Uh, she maybe is in our auditory, so if you are here, Kathleen, uh, thank you for uh, this very interesting insights that put forward social and human sciences that are too often forgotten. But thank you, uh, Julie and Mathieu, to have uh, highlighted the, the fact that humans were very um, involved in these missions. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you have some uh, questions here in the room or uh, online. Nothing, nothing, yeah. Bonjour. Merci pour your belle présentation. I have two questions for everybody. Uh, the first uh, is these missions, Europa to uh, Europa and Yemen, are flying by. So they're taking measurements from however many hundreds of kilometers. Is there a plan for a follow up mission that will land, have its floors on the icy surface? and be able to then, as you said, send something down through the ice bridge for the ocean. That's the first question. And the second question is, um, I am assuming that the science that we gather from these missions and the outer planets is going to be applied somehow in the future to learning more about the thousands of exoplanets we've been discovering way out in the universe. So I can do the first the first one and is that it is that okay? Yeah sure. Right. So the um, in answer to your question regarding follow on plans. I am not sure exactly what ESA has in the books, and there would be a question for Olivier, so maybe he can comment on that afterwards. On the NASA side, there has been a Europa lander that has been in consideration uh, for quite a few years. Its current status is uh, not very clear. There isn't enough uh, funding for NASA to do it right now. So one of the things that we'll have to see is uh, what the decade or so they you know, with the comments and how highly we prioritize that mission. So that's, there is a mission concept that has been developed and it would be realistic and we have a good idea of how we should be processed, etc. So there's a potential there is basically waiting for the opportunity to fly. Uh, regarding accessing, the, that, that, that's just a render. We will go to the surface, we will scratch about 10, 15 centimeters <laughs> to get rid of the materials that are publicly radiated. Uh, and then sample materials just a little bit below the surface to try and see what is like there. 
uh, regarding accessing the subsurface, now is the realm of technology development efforts. So NASA is investing into quite a lot of technologies uh, to understand how quickly and how well and what kind of concept it would take to literally drill through uh, the through the dry shell and then go all the way to the ocean. I think that's a much longer than the time frame. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it was about the detection of exomoons, right, in other solar systems. Yeah. Or exoplanets. Or exoplanets. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we're very limited by the resolution of the images because we make these observations from Earth with the space telescopes. So we're basically limited because it's very hard to directly observe a exoplanet or exomoon. Uh, so we have kind of indirect um, evidence. Of exoplanets, we just reached uh, 5,000 exoplanets uh, detected and confirmed. Yeah. And uh, yeah, of course, we were also trying to detect exomoons around this planet because it could mean we could have Europas or IOs or similar moons in other planetary systems, which would be very interesting. But we are even more limited by the resolution of the data because these moons are so small, it's very hard to detect them. But it seems that uh, it's possible to have some evidences of the moon. Um, so yeah, that's ongoing. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So, so just to complete, um, so right now the big interest in feeding the Neptune site. I'm not more big driver for sending a future mission to the system of the Neptune. But we think both planets are the most likely to have the moon spins out to the system. So the, the big one, the one Jupiter, they will put the ID sites, but it's not that they're just big. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Yes, uh, I, I was uh, wondering if any of these discoveries and this research, uh, how will they or how can they be <coughs> used um, to understand and to help planet Earth? and the environment on planet Earth, and how soon can this be done, and is there any possibility of that? And so we need to preserve this digital. There is all the picture of life on mobile. <laughs> Like we would with the law, and so maybe like in the future, we can be in a separate information, making sure that we fill our environment. The fact that oh, I did all that, you know, we fill our bodies like that. Imagine we can find life on the water, but it might not be on the water, no, it might be the bacteria. It would be really cool, but nothing can be what we have on it. Because when you look at, uh, you know, the, the, the abyss and the abyss, you have these vents, mm -hmm. uh, which are extraordinary and the biodiversity in there is, is not very well known. And they're already digging it to get the uh, rare earth for this, you know, for that reason. Yeah. And they're already digging up those. And I'm going, if, if we discover that there's life in these other planets, in these oceans, maybe it could help discover how important it is. Mm. Also mm. on planet Earth, yeah. not to disrupt this and to destroy it. Yeah. Okay. So JPL, yeah. I mean, sorry, JPL, uh, you know, there are huge programs for their work. Super mm. important. And, and mm. Oh, another is about of um, earth observation. Okay. Mm. We, we have another program. So at least I can understand the biodiversity. Large, the largest that we right now understand the stability of the polar caps, for example, mm -hmm. that's such a huge problem. And so, yeah, yeah. We, we focus on one aspect of the what the other aspect that do, but I mean, there is a mutual investment for even more in Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have an online question, which is How does uh, China, with its space exploration budget, uh, fit in and is it your main competitor? And the second question is, do you see an alliance between France, Europe and the United States and China 
um, for the future nations. <laughs> I didn't take that one, so I, I will put it this way. I think from the perspective of the scientists, that would be highly desirable, really highly desirable, because as you can see, we welcome scientists from everywhere, from every background, because that just helps us achieve better science. However, there are political considerations that limit the participation and the collaborations. And in the case of NASA, NASA is just not allowed to participate in jointly with China wow. to missions. That's, that's just because of the, the way the US government works as of right now. So although I think it would be highly desirable and it would help our collaboration rather than competition as, as was uh, evocated, unfortunately, the, the, the geopolitical realities do not allow for this at this time. I believe that there might be some collaborations between China and ESA, and maybe Olivier, uh, sure. if, if, if you have this, can, can you please comment on that? Yes, yes. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay, yes, uh, we can, uh, on our side, we can we can collaborate with uh, China. In fact, we, we have some ongoing collaboration, like we have a mission under preparation called a SMILE to study the magnetosphere of the Earth. So we, we, are, we are some collaboration ongoing. It's always very, uh, very fruitful. And I will not be surprised if in the area of giant planet in the in the next decades, there is a ESA China collaboration. I mean, that, that will depend on the opportunity that uh, we have in terms of, of mission and what they have. But I know that China is, is studying a, a mission to Callisto, for, for example. And in the future, we might explore uh, possibilities. So I think for, uh, from our side, it's absolutely possible to to collaborate with China, and uh, I think that could be done in the future for giant planet exploration. Thank you. Yes, Kai. Uh, I have a question for uh, life again, uh, and the physical world. What is the main limitation or challenge uh, to have a habitable world? Like you were speaking about presence of chemicals, hot and cold temperature, radiations, and different parameters. Uh, what do you expect to see and do you think uh, what would be the main limitation if we have something that is good? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that main limitation is we're not sure of what life would look like yeah. on another body. So to find it, you have to know what you're searching for, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to detect something, you have to know what you're searching for and we're really unsure of what would like look like on another body. So to me, it's the main limitation. I'm not sure if you agree. <laughs> yeah, and it's something that is shared, that people truly believe they can be shared among any kind of platform is mobility. Okay. So people have been thinking about sending a microscope that is just take a drop of water and need for variations in, in the limit, something that moves. And then you don't need them to worry really about the chemical nature or the structure. It's really just that. that is, I mean, is the matter that we're talking about submarine and the water, and that's the kind of instrument that we're thinking of maybe sending to people. But that's really, really, really exciting. If, if I can add one more, I think not only we don't really know what life to look for, so because we are, you know, life as it is on Earth, we really assume that it's going to be kind of like that. I think another challenge is that it's not one thing or the other, is that you need the right combination of all of these parameters. If you, if you have, an, you can have ocean and you can have organics. If you have absolutely no sources of energy and no way to, to, to initiate the development of life, then it wouldn't form. Or conversely, you may have a lot of energy, like an IO, but this is just way too hot to have any water, then you cannot have that. So it's really, you need the right balance. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like Goldilocks go zone. Yeah. Okay. And so would, be, would the highest possibility would be that life would stem from Earth and the possibility that um, the craft would bring something, bacteria, virus, death? Um, Yes, we have this two. We have an origin of life in situ. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what people are looking for at Europa. 
And yeah, I think that's what you're saying, the Dunstermia from uh, Ejecta, from Earth, and Mars might be a better uh, way to see life on other planets. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard for Ejecta and the uh, inner solar system to reach past Jupiter, yeah. Jupiter, and 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 the Jupiter, system we are focusing on, or we focus on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And congrats. <laughs> Yes, uh, um, I have listened to most the movie uh, Don't Look Up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's very I'm not really the influence about that. Uh, I'm not a scientist, so I really wanted to ask you: Is there any chance that because we we we're on Earth and we always uh, people that are not in science we have a huge interest of what is going on on space? So thank you for everything that you shared today with us. My question is like, where on Earth? Is there a big chance of what you know that we would have um, any sort of like um, a community or something that could hit the Earth as in this movie and it would be dangerous because also we had another movie in Hollywood about um, uh, <laughs> called, uh, I don't Similar like with COVID, mm -hmm. and we didn't believe at that time. I don't mm -hmm. remember. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have you mm -hmm. have watched it, and, and it was like um, a science movie at that mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. um, a match version. And now it's real. We had lockdowns uh, worldwide. Mm -hmm. So my question is about on Earth, and uh, is there a possibility, big possibility, that Earth is in danger from something in space? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's that's a, a real danger. I mean, NASA has a program that is called Planetary Defense, and in fact, it's, it's all, it, it, that program is used by uh, scientists at JPL and elsewhere to observe the population of near Earth asteroids, mm -hmm. and so that we so that we understand, characterize them, understand their orbits. And then once we know all of those properties, we can e evaluate the probability that one of these could uh, potentially hit the Earth. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 is, uh, that is definitely a real concern. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. probably what, uh, it's probably what wiped out the dinosaurs, right? So <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was an event in, in Russia less than 10 years ago where it was a very major and mm -hmm. um, there was a big shockwave that the world was not I don't think there were any special things that there was a event. Have you watched the show Space Force? <laughs> Space? Space Force. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Should I be scared? <laughs> And I mean, we also have the mission PDARTS that, that just launched, and the aim of the mission is like to redirect an asteroid. So for now, it's just a first test, but the, the goal is to be being able in the future to redirect an asteroid, it, it would approach Earth. So yeah, people think of it. <laughs> what is it for? Um, darts. Yeah. Darts. Sorry. Yeah, darts. 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 Uh, double asteroid redirect. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I can just add something. Sure. So space force, there was a memo that circulated yesterday, <laughs> and they found out that three years ago there was a meteor that hit Earth and there was no damage, but it was an interstellar object. Uh -huh. It came, they were able to track back its uh, orbit. It came from another mm -hmm. system wow. very fast. Mm -hmm. and that's, I think, that's the, the kind of thing that we should be worried about because right now, I mean, we are so doing that at 50 kilometers per second. But when you have an interstellar object that's of that one about kilometers per second, yeah. there is a huge amount of energy involved, and that could be. But the likelihood is very good. We have to say the likelihood that it is very, very, very low. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, yeah, yeah. May, maybe the last one, but okay. <laughs> just go on. um, a question about the, the communication aspect uh, of the mission. Uh, how long does it take for a signal from uh, wherever it is here at JPL, let's say, to reach the uh, uh, juice or Europa um, and to get the signal back? So uh, what, what is that time frame that it, that it takes for that communication to occur? And are you concerned about the time lag that will be involved? I can answer to this one. I think it's 40 minutes. We are not, we are not that far, in fact, from if you look at the, the universe, Earth, Jupiter, it's, a, it's five astronomical units. I mean, it's between four and six because of the distance uh, from the Earth, which, is, uh, which change uh, with the rotation of, the, of all the planet. So it's between uh, 30 and 50 minutes, depending on, on where we are. So it's relatively close, but that means we don't, we don't uh, uh, control the spacecraft in real time. Everything is, uh, we, we send the telecommand in advance and we receive the data later. So it's, uh, it's not a real time uh, commanding of the spacecraft, but in terms of, uh, of link, it's relatively close, so less than one hour. Yeah, I, I asked the question because I, I saw the, uh... Uh, the, the two crafts uh, coming within four hours of one another, and that seemed like an awfully close <laughs> encounter, <laughs> given the uh, distance. Yeah, it's a, it can be scary. It can be scary. <laughs> it's very unlike the other time that there are smaller crafts. But the question you asked me. Very important. We are. We need to move towards the international spacecraft that are small to me, mm -hmm. uh, because there might be many things that can happen. You know, there can be an event that sets from the direct uh, radiation and control the world spacecraft is not everything. And you know that only at the next day the communication is open. Mm -hmm. You cannot be moved for one uh, mm -hmm. to the other direction of the spacecraft. And I know it's hard to be moved. So it's almost like pre preloaded to respond to different possible events that could occur outside your ability to communicate with the spacecraft. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. The management of fault is really the one that we urgently need for more capability. We can do that in the next few but not for yeah. So as you see, this subject raises uh, many questions, <laughs> and which shows the uh, real interest of our attendees uh, on your research work. Um, but unfortunately, it is, as I said, time uh, for us to close the discussion. Uh, thank you again to all of you, uh, to our auditory, our speakers, so Julie, Elodie, uh, Mathieu, and uh, Olivier, for your presentation and for the confidence you placed in me uh, to moderate these discussions. And again to Emma Franks for hosting this Café des Sciences. Do not hesitate to uh, contact us for uh, further information. And um, so goodbye, everybody. And, uh, <laughs>